Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Safamensa. If this is your first time being on the show and watching, we thank you for tuning in, and we hope that you can come back for future episodes. If you're someone that's been with us from day one, day 10, day 15, whenever you started with us, please make sure you tell your friends to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and all streaming platforms. We are everywhere. Now, this week is special because we have not just one episode, but three phenomenal educators we're going to be featuring this week. And this is the first of three fire episodes. So this guest really needs no introduction. Uh, she is the author of this phenomenal book, Cultivating Genius. And she's currently an assistant professor at Georgia State University. And she's just doing a lot of incredible work around the world of literacy and making sure that we as teachers are looking at literacy through a, a historically responsive lens, which is something that we are going to go deep into tonight. So for those literacy teachers, ELA teachers, any teacher who is on here tonight, this is going to be a special one. So without further ado, I want to bring in Dr. Goldie Muhammad to the podcast so she can talk to us. Hi, Kwame. Thank hey, you so Goldie, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you, brother. How are you? I'm doing good, sister. Blessed to have you on the podcast. And I've been waiting for days for this to happen. <laughs> and it feels like Christmas for me. <laughs> it, it feels like it's early like Christmas for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So right now, how's it, how have you been? I know you've been doing a lot of speaking engagements and you're still teaching classes virtually and, and everything. So how has that been for you during the pandemic? You know, it was an adjustment, of course, like everybody. You know, I'm not a work from home kind of person. <laughs> um, but, you know, you adjust, you respond to the social times. I mean, I've always sort of been in that mind frame that my mind, body, work, spirit has to be responsive to what's around me. And I that's what I did. I, I got adjusted. And, you know, at times I'm tired. At, at times I'm exhilarated. And I have lots of energy and joy from this work. And so it's a balance of all those things. And I keep really great people around me to remind me of what matters, starting with myself and my health and my mind. So um, that helps to that helps with the tiredness. No, I'm sure it does. And oh, um, Sister Yolanda, thank you so much for the correction. Associate professor, not a <laughs> There's a difference. I'll make sure I put some respect on your name. <laughs> That's so, my best friend. And so she does what best friends do. <laughs> no, and you need best friends like that to make sure that people are held accountable. So, Sister Yolanda, I appreciate you. Dr. Yeah. Yolanda Sealy Ruiz. So, thank you. Yes. Um, but I'm just, but yeah, this is so much to talk about. So much, so much to talk about. So let's go right in. First question I always ask my guest is to tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you into the field of education. Yeah. Um, so uh, my full name is Golnisar. And I like to say that because people know Goldie a whole lot, but they need to know Golnisar too. And my name means sharing flowers and roses and gardens. And so that's that's who I am. That's who I've become somehow. Um, I'm from Gary, Indiana. And like most, like a lot of people who wanted to become a teacher, I would, you know, play with my dolls as a child and play school, right? With, with my siblings. As long as I had uh, some chalkboard and some chalk, I had something to learn and something to teach. And I'm very much like that today. I love uh, create learning new things and teaching new things after I learned them. 
And I fell in love with this idea of being a teacher because I fell in love with knowledge and I fell in love with Islam. As a very young girl, um, Islam is a faith that puts education uh, centered and it's a faith that grounds everything in seeking knowledge and truths and justice. And so I kind of use that identity of who I am and I brought that into like the field of teaching. And so I've been a teacher, I've studied to be a teacher and a school district administrator. I thought I would uh, want to work uh, for the Department of Education one day. That was my initial um, goal, especially after I got my PhD. Um, and I've been a school teacher, a literacy coach, a school district administrator, a school board president. And I still, you know, try to teach youth as much as I can to stay connected to what teachers experience. Um, and so, yeah, and then growing up around Chicago area, I became a part of a program called Golden Apples of Illinois. And they pick about 100 high schoolers each year, I think, and they sort of train them to be teachers yeah. uh, right away. And so it was those kind of experiences that that made me love it even more. No, absolutely. And I am familiar with Golden Apple. Um, that's a teacher. They have a teacher residency program, but it's basically a grassroots teacher ed program in the Chicago area. And they start early. Like you said, they start from the high school level yeah, all the way through to undergrad, all the way to when you go into the classroom, um, you know, in Illinois. So great program. Uh, shout out to Golden Apple. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So, and also my sister, she um she's at UIC. So I know okay, she did a doctoral there. So she's in yeah. UIC right now, finishing her doctorate. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. We have to we have I have to connect to, with her. Yeah, I'll I'll let her know. <laughs> so you wrote the book Cultivating Genius, which is a phenomenal book. And I'm not the biggest reader in my family, but this book, I was done within a week. Yeah. <laughs> Probably would have been done within three days uh, because it's just a perfect blend of storytelling and you do provide the the data, the quantitative data, but it's not heavy on that. It's, a, it's like a perfect blend that just allows the reader to really process the information, but also to let them know that these are all factually based, you know, at the same time. So I want you to tell us what inspired you to write Cultivating Genius. And I know that you have been writing articles and, and other publications about the content within the book for a number of years, but what inspired you to write the book as a whole? And how long did that process take? Yeah, well, you know, thank you for saying that. I wanted it to be read, picked up and read in a week and and maybe reread and you you pick up something new from it, you know. So it's nice that's a nice sort of affirmation that um it came through for you in that way. But you know, what inspired me to write the book is because I love black people. I love our stories, our energy, our love for humanity our hearts, our stories. And I wanted to tell um, some of that story because, you know, I, we, we don't teach our histories in schools at, at, at the type of places that, at the type of levels that we need to. Right. And, you know, I wanted to teach uh, teachers and leaders and teacher educators that, we have been doing education in a way that is uh, seeped in smallness when we compare to this greatness of our history. And so I fell in love with reading us and reading this part of history. But at the same time, and as I always am, my pen is inspired by a lot of pain and a lot of joy equally. And mm -hmm. so um, that's that was my inspiration now. The, the, in terms of like writing the book, while I was writing the book or thinking about the book, I kind of consider conceptualizing writing as a part of writing. 
And at the time I was doing a lot of work in New York City. I love, I love New York City teachers and I was there and they became like my family and administrators all across the boroughs and they were giving me so much love. And it was like, I was on a book tour without, without a book. <laughs> and right. so the narratives and the stories, it, it, it's sort of like I was giving so many talks that I would memorize, you know, what I would say, the stories, the jokes, the, the messages. And um, it's sort of, I just like put them all out, you know, like just put it all out. Uh, and, and, and the writing came so fast because it was in my, my head for so long. And that's, of course, after doing a great deal of research starting in graduate school on Black literary societies. And yes, and I want to talk about the Black literary societies for a second, because as I was reading about the history of 19th century Black literary societies, there was a lot of information that I was even aware of as I was reading it. And I couldn't help but think it's so much greatness back then. You know, you had these groups who are reading different types of literature, whether it was articles, whether it was publications, and it was, they're using it as a vehicle, not just to comprehend, but, but for liberation for black people. Like it was ultimately for that. So I'm wondering how do we go from being these great literary societies where we're using the books, we're using all these literary texts in order to find solutions for our liberation to where people are now saying, man, if you want to hide the truth about what's really going on in America and what's really going on in our society, just put it in a book. That's how you can hide it from Black people. How do we go from that to, to this falsehood or this narrative that is spewing out these days? Yeah, you know, um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. You know, I would argue that we have always been great. Uh, the greatness in uh, before and after Black literary societies, we have always been readers and writers and thinkers and creators and um, geniuses. And it has just been like the erasure of our history that will tell us that we go from this to that. Mm -hmm. It's the deliberate uh, actions of leaving us out of everything, of curriculum, of knowledge, of truths. I mean, it, it is so much history that, um, and so much like agendas and organizing that were deliberate in keeping our genius down, our, our stories, our truths, our knowledge away that we, we have sort of subscribed or come to this. Because who said, if you wanna keep something from black folks, put it in a book? Uh, is, did that come from whiteness? Uh, did that come from, <laughs> that, that don't come from blackness. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? But you know, if you, if you, are, if you are subscribing to that agenda of self-hate and white supremacy, it would make you believe the worst of yourself. And that's what's happened. No, um, absolutely. I could not agree with you more about that. But it's just, it's sad that that narrative is, is, is even out there, you know, to begin with. And we have to do what we need to do as teachers and as school leaders to, to eradicate, you know, that narrative because it's still in our schools to this day. I mean, to this very day, we're still trying to uh, find ways to bring in culturally responsive texts. We're trying to find ways to reverse this whitewashing of our history. We're still talking about this and this yeah. has been going on for so many years, even before I was born. And I've been on this earth for almost 40 years. We're still talking about this, right? Yeah. So, and, and yeah, it's just so much to talk about. Yeah, so it is. And you know, the people who are like over curriculum, I pick, I, I listen to them and I watch them. And I'm like, you know, when I, I look at who's writing the curriculum, they have they have been conditioned toward this same agenda. And then they produce stuff for schools that uh, matches if they haven't disrupted that kind of thinking. 
or you know there was somebody starting like a, a black history um collection of unit plans and they start the history with enslavement mm -mm. So i'm just like what year are we living in? You don't, you haven't heard enough podcasts <laughs> or read a book yourself. So I don't know that, that, that line of you want to keep something from a book. I don't know if that applies to us. Right. We're not, we're not the ones all the time at those tables creating that curriculum. And so we got to, uh, it's so much, it's so many variables to it. And, and that's why, you know, I really wanted the book to start off with who we are. I wasn't writing for white folks. I wasn't writing for like, you know, folks trying to tell them to do better. I'm writing for truth and justice, and I'm also writing for us. And so, I mean, I hope that came through because that was my purpose. <laughs> no, and I know that it came through for a lot of people because the reviews of the book have been astounding. Um, and I need to make sure I put that official one in there myself because we need, a, we need people to have this book. This is a book that should be in every school district. Every school needs to have this book. Every pre-service teaching program needs to have this book. Teacher ed program. So everybody needs to have this book. It's a must have. But before we get deep into the curriculum piece, because I have a question about that, because I have my own thoughts about it. Okay. Let's talk about historically responsive literacy framework, which is what the book is heavily based on. And you've talked about the four components of this framework, which I believe is something that needs to be implemented in every literacy curriculum, right? Yeah. So if you could just share what the historically responsive literacy framework is, and what those four main components are within that framework. And we don't wanna to give too much away because we want people to actually buy the book to read it in more depth. But if you could just give a clip notes version of what that is. Yeah, so it's basically, um, historically responsive means that it comes from black history. It is responsive to, it's a framework that is collectively responsive to students' histories, identities, literacies, and liberation without sacrificing any of them. It sees literacy as being synonymous with education. To be literate is to be educated. Yes. Um, right? And so, you know, it. I don't look at literacy as like a discipline area or a content area, but um, an approach to how we learn in every single content area and every single facet of life. Okay. And so when I studied black historical archives and black documents and readers and writers and thinkers from, you know, the early 1800s onward, I would find that when they talked about their schools, their education, however their education spaces looked, we had to constantly create something out of nothing. And so school looked anywhere school had to look. <laughs> and so when I studied this part of our history, I found that they had uh, four, which I have really uh, added recently, five um, goals for learning. And while we call goals for learning or learning goals, learning standards today, they didn't call them standards because a standard is a, a word that signifies that there's a stopping point or a ceiling and a pursuit indicates that this is for my life. I'm learning this not just to test prep or get into college, but for the wholeness of my being. And so they had four or five pursuits for learning and they were identity development. Every time they read, wrote, think, engaged in mathematics, science, history, all these things, they were developing a sense of self and learning about people who were also different than them. The second goal were skills and proficiencies. They were learning the skills and proficiency needed for different disciplines. The third is intellectualism. As they were engaging in their learning, they were becoming smarter about new histories, concepts, people, places, things, all that. And the fourth is criticality. You know, criticality isn't critical thinking. It is learning about liberation, liberation of self mm. and liberation of others who have been marginalized um, 
experience unfairness, racism, sexism, anything that's sort of dealing with uh, marginalization or exploitation. And then the last goal or pursuit was joy. They elevated joy and happiness of themselves and people around them by learning the truth of who they are, who they were, and um, the truth of others and real narratives, uh, the accurate narrative, right? Not just these, it wasn't the counter narrative, it was the narrative. Everything they saying is the counter. We don't have to produce a counter narrative to some white uh, normed supremacy. That's not who we are. And so with these five pursuits, you know, I encourage, you know, these five pursuits are kind of magical in a way because I see them everywhere. You know, like Friday when I heard the cookbook at um, the virtual cookbook with, with my imam, um, I noticed that, you know, I noticed all five elements within that. When I study and write curriculum, I notice all five elements with that. You can be dating somebody and look for all five elements. These yes. things are very essential to life. And so, but mostly I am encouraging teachers and leaders to create leadership practices and pedagogy around those five areas. No, awesome, awesome. And I want to tie that into the Common Core curriculum. So as a teacher who's taught middle school math for almost 10 years in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, the Common Core standards were the main standards I had to use. Those were the standards that were used to evaluate my teaching performance. Those were the standards that were used for our scope and sequence every year. Those were the standards that were used to assess student understanding of different skills and concepts that they were being taught. And you mentioned your book that the Common Core standards focus too heavily on those two pursuits of skills and intellect. It's very, they focus on those two, but not enough on identity and criticality. Yeah. And, and they really don't focus on intellect for real, for real. Well, it's slightly, mostly. not heavily, slightly. but slightly. Right. I was trying to give a little bit of credit, but, uh, <laughs> but, but definitely the skills part, they really focus on. Sure. And when you think about, and as a math teacher, I've, I've always been a type that felt like it doesn't matter what content area you teach, every teacher is a literacy teacher. Yes. As a math teacher, I had a word wall. You had to learn math vocabulary. When yeah. you're doing a word problem, you are applying those same comprehensive comprehension strategies that you would if you were reading a passage from a story. Yeah. Or or a chapter book or a novel. So it was always interesting to me when I would spend all year drilling my students on just word problems and just telling them like, hey, like you need to know this word and how to use it in context, because if you're going to be a mathematician, you have to speak like a mathematician. Yeah. Right. But then you get to this, the test, whatever the state test you you administer at the end of the year. Everything is computations, algorithms, but not enough focus on writing, math writing. So then the kids are looking at me like, Mr. Soft Mensa, we have spent all this time, eight, nine months, focusing on how to write responses to math problems. But I felt like, no, this is important. You yeah. need to- The test is the goal. Right. That's sad for me. Right. And that's why- I wanted to ask this question because when I think about my own training as a teacher, Common Core is drilled into my brain so often. And I didn't know any better. I was just trying to get my certification so I could be able to teach in my classroom. I didn't have the knowledge 10, 11 years ago that I have now. Mm -hmm. So I want to know from you, knowing, knowing what Common Core has done, how do you think the implementation of the historically responsive literacy framework will impact teacher prep programs, standardized tests, but also teacher performance evaluations? Because I think you have to look at it from those three perspectives because 
you see what Common Core has done with those three buckets. Yeah, so I'm wondering. Yeah. If we, this is why con, this is why we need uh, standards for equity and excellence. I don't. I argue that uh, some people say we the Common Core is just fine, and I would love to debate with them on that because that's what the thinkers do. We we debate, and. Um, I don't feel the common core is excellent and complete as it's written. It feels incomplete. It feels absence of black liberation and black histories and what we deem to be the standards for learning. And then we struggle to get it right with black children. There's a disconnect. Well, we wonder why we struggle to get it uh, right with them because we are within systems, starting with the common core, um, that are not aligned to the children, all of the children. It's aligned to the history and the lives of others. White people never had to, just as an example, mm -hmm. white people never needed goals, standards of identity because the world showed different manifestations of beauty of who they are. They show different manifestations of excellence of who they are. They never need learning standards set around criticality because they didn't have that kind of oppression. You only need it when it's been done. Something has been done to you to say this is a need and a, and a desire now. But what ends up happening is that those five pursuits are great for all children, um, not just for some. And so with, with teacher education, we have to uh, shake it all up. It's time for programs to spread out their program syllabi and ask, who am I reading? Who, who are the students reading? Who are they not reading? What theorists are they learning from? Um, how much is this seeped in black and cultural and gender studies? Because those are intersectional fields that can help us understand uh, education and teacher education better. And so we need to change our programs and our, our, our syllabi and our curriculum in those programs. And we need to start letting students know that this is a program grounded in equity and social political consciousness. If you don't want that, because there are some students out there that's like, I just want to teach the skills. Just teach me how to teach the skills. I don't mm -hmm. want to teach in this political agenda. It's not a political one. It's a human one. And if political means that some people are not liberated in your literacy skills, then you should be one in a political agenda too. But we are at a point in time where you cannot enter this program and not learn criticality and social justice. Choose another field to go in. And we have to be very adamant by telling our teacher candidates that and not just thinking that, uh, oh, we need our enrollment numbers to go up. No, not if it's not if it's at the expense of later putting teachers out there who are going to do harm to our children. No, no, absolutely. And as you were talking, and I'm thinking again about my own teacher training experience. Now, if you ask me who Jean Piaget is, who Lef Vygotsky is, who Edward Skinner, those those people are, mm -hmm. I can tell you in a heartbeat because guess what? Those are the same theorists and psychologists that. I need to know in order to pass my praxis test. Yeah. In order to pass my teaching licensure test. It's all jacked up. They're not all, but none of these people are black people or people of what color. What has Vygotsky done for black pe children? No, you know? Nothing. I mean, oh. when have I ever used zone of proximal development <laughs> in any time, you know, I was in the classroom? But imagine if I went into my teacher education program and I was exposed to a uh, Dr. Asa Hillier, for instance. Yeah. Imagine if I had a Dr. Asa Hilliard in my program and yeah. I read about him. Yeah. And then I entered the classroom. The you, way that you I would know how to get it right. He he was the first, he was he said our children are geniuses. He's a godfather. Yeah. <laughs> One of the godfathers. Like, yeah. but but not so many people know about Dr. Asa Hilliard. Yeah, you're right. That, that's a shame. It is a shame. It's a shame. And, it's a low down, dirty shame. <laughs> right. And and I just think about how different I would be as a teacher if I was exposed to those type of people in my program. And, you know, thankfully, I went to Temple University, first university with a PhD 
program for African American studies. So I was able to be exposed to a lot of these scholars. Yeah. A lot of people go to PWIs, they don't get this type of exposure. Right. And it's almost as if they they don't find out until later on, you know, who these people are. And by that time, so much damage has already been done. Yeah. Not, not on purpose, but I don't know if it's on purpose or not. It feels like it's purposeful. And it, it once again, um, it's, it's the black historicalness that gives us the model, the playbook, the guidebook for all. That's what you just described. Yes. And the playbooks that you're referring to are the same playbooks for our liberation. I mean, when you think about what happened in Georgia a few days ago, if you go back to what John Lewis did and all those other people who who pretty much fought to get the Voting Rights Act in place for us to be able to vote, that's all part of history. So we think there's so many examples in history that when you read about them, they manifest themselves even now. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of these things are not new things, but we have to go back to those books. We have to go back to our history to see that, no, there's an answer to a lot of the issues that are happening now. If we just go back. The answer to everything is all you have to do is study history. No, a- absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we know this is what needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Now people are on the anti-racist tip, right? Everybody mm-hmm. is. It's it's the trend. You know, education is very trendy. Yeah, we, it's the new diversity. Right. <laughs> DEI, but it makes it more powerful <laughs> Every day, everybody is red, white fragility. Everybody's red, how to be anti-racist. And they both serve their, their purposes, you know, in the work, but it's not the end all be all. And by reading those works, and they should be reading a lot, a whole lot of other ones, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to know, how can we get school leaders and teachers to implement the HRL framework in their own schools, but not only implement it, do it with fidelity? Okay, so to answer this question, I want to be as plain as I can be. The first thing states need to do, or even at a national level, and this could be the first priority for the Secretary of Education for K-12 schools, we need new standards for across, uh, we need to add to them, make them more complete, make them more comprehensive, make them more related to these equity and historically responsive pursuits. Because there are some teachers that will follow those and not go outside and we need them to go outside of them. You can rewrite, because we have Common Core already written, you can add and revise them in like a week or a month, it is not going to take that long. We have the genius and the mind power here on this earth. I can get a group, a team together and do that easily. And then the second thing we have to do is write the rubrics and the criteria for publishing companies to write more and comprehensive, more equitable, more anti-racist and more historically responsive curriculum is we're not going to accept any curriculum in in Chicago, in New York, in Atlanta, anywhere. We're not going to accept it. So we're going to have better standards. Again, about a good month. You can write the rubric. You take those standards and write better selection criteria for selecting publishing companies so that they do better. That's number two. And then you have to change assessments. Stop Stop thinking equity data is just how many kids, black and white, have dropped out. That's not equity data. I want to know how that child has experienced criticality learning, identity development from the beginning of the school year to the end. That's the data I want to see just as much as I want to see the skills data. If you start with those three areas, and of course, teacher education has to be the the starting point. 
Yes. Right. And so if you start to those and then you use the framework to interview teachers, to recruit new teachers, to retain teachers, especially teachers of color, then we have some transform some transformation. Right. Not right. Change. We have transformation when we start changing those different parts. And if the if the common core was fine as they are and the standards before that, then why do we have the same results? Something ain't working. No, and and just to quickly touch on the standardized testing, I just find it amazing how in the midst of this pandemic, we have school districts that are mandating that standardized testing has to take place this school year when there's been so much inconsistency and, and interruption in the learning process with, with our students. And, and then... And what's contradictory about that is we always hear about, let's get the data from, from these tests. But how are you going to get reliable data if there's been so much interruption? So in much equity, some students don't have access. Right. I mean, it's, it's foolish is what it is. And it is false. We have to stop telling lies. We do not have to do the standardized tests. And why not use this? as a moment to do something different, to say, you know what, let's, let's take, let's create a standardized equity test uh, about collecting data on those four elements. Why don't we do something different? We don't have to do the standardized test. That's what people feel safe with. As long as they know that students with certain access to digital uh, like to Wi-Fi computers and all this, what people call digital equity now, they know that uh, the tests will remind us that we are up here and others are not. See, we're not we're not doing that. We don't need to take the test. That's not a thing. That's something that um, they want to keep uh, capitalism going, making money off of black failure going, and so they think they need it. What will we lose our lives if we didn't test kids for another year? What will happen? What will happen? Right. I mean, will the whole system fall apart? Like, I really want to know from somebody what will happen if we just did not do that. No, um, I am <laughs> totally so with you. I'm totally with you. And um, before I get into the comments, because oh, people are bringing the comments in tonight. So many great comments and, and questions, which I want to get to real shortly. Okay. But but going back to what you were saying about the standardized test, there was one student of mine I had maybe a couple years ago who refused to take the test. And what people don't realize is you don't have to take the standardized test. If you decide that you're not going to take it, you just show up and, you know, What's going to happen? They're going to expel you. Parents can opt you. out of it. They have rights. Parents can do whatever they want to. It's their child. I've had students who actually did that, and the parent brought a note to the school to me saying, uh, "Mr. Sarfamensa, your child's not going to be um, my child's not going to be doing the test today." Just want to let you know that. And honestly, I took no offense to that because I understood where the parents stood, and. I just went by my business. I read the directions, you know, as the proctor. The rest of the students took the test. The student sat quietly and did nothing. I mean, it would be pretty cool if the administrators or the teachers took the test uh, instead, right? During these very uh, uncertain, I listen to teachers' hearts every single day. I ask them how their hearts are doing. And they are stressed. And it is, it's a lot going on. And if you ask us adults who are supposed to have it together more and have more social emotional everything than compared to a child, you tell us to take a test and see how the anxiety will build up. No, um, absolutely. And there were a few great comments here, a lot of great comments, but there was one question that I do want to get back to. And okay. it goes back to what we were talking about with accountability. How do we make our schools and districts more accountable uh, when it comes to making learning equitable and implementing yeah. the HRL standards? So this is from Nita. She's, she asked the question, 
how do we as educators get on the committees to make changes to the Common Core standards that infuses us within it to ensure that our history is taught? Yeah, how can we be more accountable for being human is what, <laughs> and that's a tough question. I mean, it's a tough answer because if you think about it, how can we hold people more accountable for being more human, for doing humanizing practices? That's the question. How can you hold people's humanity accountable as another human? And I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but I am saying this. Do not wait for the United States government. Do not wait for the state. Districts and schools can do this work if you have enough people and if you have support from leadership because that matters. If you have enough people at the table, you can, and then you know what's needed. You got the playbooks, you got the guides, you got the theory and you got the model for practice. I say, do it and ask what you need to ask for to support you in creating something different. You know, whether it is a summer, you know, hey, principal, superintendent, here's my proposal. I used to give proposals all the time when I was a teacher. I came with every time I met with somebody, I came with a proposal written when I was 21, 22 years old. So have a proposal and say, we want to rewrite the math standards to be more equitable, to be more human. We want to rewrite some of these central units for teaching. Can you give us a stipend? Can you give us some release time? Whatever you need to get the job done. Do not wait and do not, uh, don't go with the mediocre basic uh, standards and curriculum that you may be given because then you're doing hurt and harm and a disservice to children. So that's what you can do if you're really serious about the work. It's not going to be easy. If it was easy, you know, we wouldn't, um, you know, be talking about all this, but it will be joyful and it will have outcomes for generation. It will be like a sacrifice that could have stronger outcomes for future generations. No, um, absolutely. And wow, so many great questions coming up. But here's what I find interesting. We use the term standardized test, right? Uh -huh. now, now, for, now, first and foremost, we have students who have IEPs. We have students who have 504 plans. We have students who are ELLs. And, and, and I've seen this myself and other, a lot of my colleagues have seen this, they're all taking the same test. That's a problem, that there's no modifications to it. And I know, I don't know if it's the case in every state, but I know when I was in, um, I know I'm here in Massachusetts and like I saw students who were ELLs, levels one and two, taking a standardized test and all they got was maybe a dictionary like maybe a Spanish English dictionary or something. And that was their accommodation like that. That's a problem. And then but this is why parents, we, if you don't have a child, everybody, this is everybody's responsibility. Yeah. And you have to know policy and mandates because folks might not uh, give your child everything that your child uh, needs, deserves all of that. Uh, parents have a lot of rights for modifications, for time, for all sorts of things. If only we pushed it and advocated for it. We can, if parents all came together, imagine this. Parents all come together and say, we are, we are taking our children out of our schools. Unless you give us better curriculum, better, which means better standards, right? And a, and a test that they could, um, that shows different parts of their genius, right? Yes. Uh, because genius is not just skills, that shows different parts of the genius. What would happen if, if we did that? If parents said, no, we're not allowing this, we're not taking it, what will happen? Change will happen. Because without children, we don't have a budget, we don't have schools, how are we gonna pay teachers? And so you would, again, history tells us what to do. 
you galvanize, you organize, you plan, and then you can you take yourself out of situations that are not benefiting you and create your own. No, no, absolutely. I mean, we we have to understand as parents, as people in the community that we are stakeholders of the education process. And I think that gets lost somewhere when we talk about these issues. Like, yeah. like the students need to have a voice as well. I've I've heard people say there should be there should be a student union. We have unions for teachers. How can we have unions for, for students? students? That historically, again, right. everything can be explained and solved. It's in history. Um, it, it, that's what I said. It's purposeful. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, let me see. We had we had another question here. So, and, and this is just my final point on this. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that we have standardized tests. I mean, for for how many years have they tried to standardize culture? You know, in this country, we we standardize tests, we standardize culture. We're trying to get people to adhere to, you know, westernized ideals and and ideologies and and just a way of a way of living. So, when you think about just the history of of our country, the history of the education system, it shouldn't come as a surprise. But but at the same time, you know, we we still have to do what we need to do to to change what's going on, you know, in our schools. Yeah. And I you know, I've never been one that has been against uh, test testing children, uh, having standards. I've never been against that. It is the type of test. If they're, if they're biased, if they're problematic. Right. Right. If, if the standards are incomplete and problematic. Or it's the way we use it. And we, we create so much pressure for teachers. Um, I'm all for I'm all for accountability and being excellent too. Um, excellence is what drives me every day. <laughs> you know, so you can be excellent and accountable and still not and still do something very differently. And I don't I think people think that it's like this either or. They, they think that like you need account accountability isn't excellence. Taking a test every year isn't excellent. It can be. It's just the way it was written. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, even now in 2020, we're still talking about the fact that tests are culturally biased. These yeah. same tests that we're referring to are culturally biased, you know, and we're still talking about this issue in 2020. We were talking about it 10 years ago. We were talking about it 20 years ago. We are talking about it 30 years ago. It's still the same. It's the same issue that's just repeating itself. But um, Caroline had a question for you, and she wanted to know, do you see any common qualities or something about a culture, about school culture in the places that are the most open? And successful in adopting your ideas, whether it's from oh, yeah. the book. That's an easy question. All right. Uh, leadership. <laughs> leadership. The leadership is excellent. It is not just rhetoric. It's about action. The leaders are present when talking about curriculum. Leaders can write a unit plan. How many principals write lesson plans and teach them? How, how many lesson plans do they write a year? Do they know pedagogy? Have they been master teachers? Right. Whatever you want to call it. You know, these teachers who can go into any class and teach and teach well with excellence. And that's important for professors to have who are bringing up the next generation of teachers. It's all about leadership. And of course, like uh, when teachers, when there's teachers and uh, all these other things on board, like curriculum and all these things that helps, but I'm telling you, the right leader can make make magic happen, turn something out of nothing. I mean, it it, it that's the that's the common variable. No, no, absolutely, I'm with you with that. I'm definitely with you. And to even add on um, to your point, you know about that. When we talk about master teachers. 
the master teachers aren't the ones that are most knowledgeable about Common Core standards. Like if you remove the Common Core standards, they'll still be able to come into that classroom and teach the most phenomenal lesson you don't need a tech for those students. You don't, you, don't, you don't need that. And and I think and I think there's some people like myself who love to supplement. I don't just look at the scope of sequence and just live and die by it. You know, I'm gonna find ways to teach this concept and this lesson that's going to make sense for my students. I'm gonna make the adjustments, I'm going to make the audibles necessary to ensure that my students are able to build their own agency around these skills and, and these concepts. But some people, you they need the book, they need the scope, they need the sequence, they need to be able to follow the script and yeah. that's not teaching. I mean, when I was a school district administrator, teachers used to tell me, I can't teach yet. I don't got the textbook. Right. And I said, uh, are you a scholar of language, of, mathem of mathematics, of science, of history? They don't need books. They don't need textbooks. The textbooks are probably limited anyway. But that's how we start. We have to start thinking about, we have to start considering, are we scholars of the discipline that we teach? Do we love language? Do we love arts? Do we love all these things? And then do we go out into the world and see mathematics? in communities, in people, in nature, in the things that have been created for us. If you don't, you're going to ask for the textbooks and the script. <laughs> no, um, absolutely. And, and, then, and then also, and I'm using math again because I was a math teacher, but I can't teach my kids about math if I haven't studied about ancient Kemet and how the commissions played a huge role in the development of mathematics. It's not part of my common core curriculum, but I should still be able to teach it because it's relevant. But that's not common. Students. Yeah, that's not common from a lot of math teachers that I've talked to. And I mean, we know that there's problems with that. Right. And why should I have that dilemma of, oh, I don't know if I should teach this because I've had these dilemmas myself. Like, I really want to teach this, but I got a deadline. We got this interim coming up. That's like and a doctor saying, you know, I really want to prescribe what the patient needs, but the pharmaceutical company is like pushing me to push this drug. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like that. It's not exactly the same, but it's, a, it's a, 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 it comes down to our ethics. Right. And um, Andrea actually has a question. This will be the last question I'll take and then we'll get into the lightning round. Uh, her question is, what's the best way to engage with colleagues and teachers who are unwilling, that's a good one, or reluctant to change, even if they believe it is for the benefit of children? And how can we galvanize principals and school leaders who are overwhelmed and put practical issues forever at the forefront at the expense of vision. So basically what we were just talking about, because you were a school administrator and I'm sure you had people in the central office in your district saying, you need to make sure that you do this with your faculty. And you knew like, okay, this doesn't feel right, but it's a mandate. These There's some things that are like non-negotiables you have to do, but you know, like, no, nah, I'm going to, do some things that I know my staff needs. So here's the thing. <laughs> I want to say to the colleagues, like, tell them to stop being basic. Uh, but <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. It's, you know, but it's, it's 8.25. So I'm just, I, you know, 8 o'clock, I start really telling the truth. Hey. But look, in terms of the, lead, the whole leadership, mm. it, it baffles me that we continue to have the same mission and vision statement and uh, strategic plan when it has not worked, meaning it has not largely accelerated academic achievement, personal achievement, joy and happiness. It hasn't at levels that I'm talking about over like 25, 30 years. Look at trend data, look at data across your whole school district. 
it baffles me that the next school year will come and we do the same thing. See, that is very basic thinking. That is not genius. It is like, and it is is being overwhelmed. You are hired to be able to take the fuzzy, the overwhelmness and, and, and put it into spaces where it makes sense and tells a better story and, and starts, I mean, that's what leaders do. Leaders take a lot of complicatedness and make it plain and clear. And leaders also will say, this has not worked, it is foolish. Mm -hmm. Do the same thing, like stop the foolishness. It is foolish to do the same thing and to do, or just to tokenize equity like we've been doing. Yes. And so I always ask people, is this the best we can do? And I'm guessing that people don't do things differently because one, they don't think it's possible for they see the limitations in black and brown children. Yes, but they see the limitations in themselves and they don't want to admit it. So they don't see as possible. And then secondly, they don't know how to do it. And so this is where we have to spend budgets differently to teach us how. This is where leaders, even though you're overwhelmed, you need to stay up. <laughs> Metaphorically, I'm not trying to say don't get any sleep <laughs> right, right. and figure this stuff out and get your people around you to help you and stop saying that you can't fire anybody or write them up. You just let harm continue to happen when you see it in your colleagues and you don't do anything about it. So I need leaders to be bold and powerful. And to colleagues who don't want humanizing, ask them, why don't you want humanizing curriculum? Why do you feel it's okay? Are you uncomfortable with it? Do you not see the genius in yourself? Do you not see the genius in blackness? What is it? I get to the root of that stuff. I don't accept it. And then, you know, if your colleagues are who they are and leaders are accepting that, you know, is it your job or your mission? That goes back to the question that I always ask. No, and and we have to continue to ask that question. People need to be honest about why they're in the classroom because we know that there are certain people who should not be in the classroom in the first place and they're just going through the motions. We need to get people to be honest about why they're here, right? But look, we've gone real heavy. It's time to bring some joy to our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and, and shift to the lightning round. Uh-oh. Yes. So we have a few quick hitter questions to ask you just to get to know you a little bit more outside of this incredible work. That you that you're doing, mm -hmm. and for people to just get to know more about Dr. Goldie Muhammad, you know, outside the classroom. Uh, so you already have the questions, so they're not surprises, no curveballs, maybe one. <laughs> I have to ask based on the comments here, but here's my first question. Okay, what is your favorite self care activity that brings you joy? Um, you know, you did give me this question. I should have thought about it. I sure did. Um, two things. Um, watching The Office. <laughs> Great show. <laughs> it's so funny. Great show. Okay. Um, and then two, um, I would say these uh, calls that I have with my best friend, Yolanda Seely Ruiz, the one, the, the incredible, we have catfish meetings. Um, almost every night and <laughs> nobody knows like the meanings of our secret coded language, but it's really cool and it's really fun. And when I talk to her, I feel like everything will be okay in the world, anything that's wrong. So that feels like self-care to me. Yes. And Dr. Ilana Silly Ruiz is in the audience and we, we thank you, doctor, for your input throughout this whole show. We appreciate it. All right. Um, second question I have is, other than your book, 
Can you share one book that every ed educator should read before they even enter this classroom? Um, my first thought is um, Jacqueline Jones Royster's book, Traces of a Stream. You know, I'm all for like reading primary source documents and, um, and historical work um, to under understand and apply it to education. And she writes about uh, African-American women and their literacy practices and social change in this book. And I feel that like black women are beautiful people to help us of how to understand education today and how to um, improve education today. And so, yeah, that, that's one of my favorite books. All right. And I haven't read that book yet. So I'm going to add that to my book list, which is continuing to grow. Okay. <laughs> Um, if you can choose three influential figures that are alive that you can invite to dinner, who would they be? Um, so, I mean, the first one is hands down prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I mean, he's a messenger of God. <laughs> so I want to learn everything more about Islam and, you know, when I read about him, his character, his heart is so beautiful and pure. And I mean, it's just, it just gives me joy to even think about that. Uh, the second person would be um, Brother Malcolm, Malcolm X. Yes. Um, for just reasons that are obvious. I mean, powerful, influential, and the, his joy, his spirit. Um, uh, the third one... I mean, if it was another historical figure, uh, Mary, I, you know, I was kind of thinking like Harriet Tubman or Mary McLeod Bethune. I feel like Mary McLeod Bethune and I would be in like home girls and we have a lot of shared interests. And uh, I feel like even our writings, I feel connections through our writings. Um, so that would probably be my third one. And I would love like Yolanda to be there too, because, you know, then we could talk about our conversations that I had with all these influential people. <laughs> no, um, absolutely. And finally, well, actually I have two more questions. Second uh -huh. to last one, who would be, who should be a future guest on this podcast? Um, Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz. I'm not just saying that because she's my best friend. I'm saying it because she's the best. Um, you know, she just finished, wrote and published this incredible book. I don't know if I have it with me somewhere in my bookshelf, but she wrote a book, um, Love from the Vortex and other poems. I don't know. I feel like I carry that book all around the house. And so it could be anywhere in the house, but she, um, she 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 uh she really grounds this idea of love and and the way she connects love to every aspect of our existence in our life and um the the intimacy in her words she's a beautiful poet and it it really pushes us to not only think about ourselves our lives and unpacking unpacking our self love because that's where it starts with education. You don't get to anything else <laughs> until you start there. And so she reminds us through her um, courage, she reminds us of that being such an important thing. And, um, you know, through it, we feel brave to explore who we are. And if you can do that, I feel like you can live better, you can love better, you can educate better. So she would be a great, great person to learn. She's my teacher. So you know, I'm going to always suggest, you know, go up a level to my teacher next. <laughs> All right. We'll have to find a way to make that happen. Um, I know we have a lot of phenomenal guests coming up, you know, in future weeks. Well, it's going to be a great season. I'm already excited. Mm. Already excited. Um, but I have one more question. I didn't give you this question, but um, mm -hmm. word on the street is, Somebody, well, a lot of people want you to be the next secretary of education for this new administration that's coming into the White House. <laughs> if, you know, if Sister Kamala or, or Joe Biden were to give you that call to say, hey, Dr. Muhammad, we want you to join, join a team, would you accept? You know, there's a lot of things I don't know. 
but I do know this one thing mm -hmm. that it, what is meant for you will be no matter how much you try to block it, speak against it, what is meant for you will be and what is not meant for you will not be. As much as you try to push for it, campaign for it, whatever it is, it won't be meant to be. So if it is meant to be for me, if that is uh, whenever, wherever I am in my life, um, there's no there's no stopping it. And I, I accept, I'm learning, the older I get, I'm learning to accept all the beautiful things that come to me and all the um, scary and th fearful things that come my way too. So yeah, we'll see. Wow. So humble. You're just so humble. <laughs> I, I just love that. But I'll just say that you have my vote. <laughs> we should be able to vote for the secretary. No, no, for real. You have my vote. I mean, I'm just thankful that we have a first lady who is an educator. That's a start. Yeah. Hopefully that will lead to some positive changes, you know, in our profession. But yeah, you have my vote for sure. Yeah. And, and then, look at the new common core standards. I'll be the first one yeah, to knock on the door, and tell them I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So last question. How can viewers follow you on social media? to continue to support the work you're doing and then also let them know where they can get Cultivating Genius, which everybody should get. Y'all get this book now. Yeah. Um, so on Twitter and Instagram, I'm Goldie M G H O L D Y in the letter M. Um, I have a Facebook Cultivating Genius Facebook page. Um, Hill Pedagogies at Gmail. Um, so yeah, and people send me messages. I respond to everyone if they had some time. I'm laughing because Yolanda says she's going to be my campaign manager. She yeah. be <laughs> I can't think of anyone better. But yeah, um, I'll respond to you for sure. Um, in terms of the book, um, you know, there are there's a website that shows you where you can get books from independent bookstores. I can't think of the name of it, but I know someone will add it to the chat. Um, and you can also buy it at the Schomburg um, Center for Black Culture, of course, through Scholastic, um, the publisher, um, Amazon, and all these other places, barnesandnoble.com, Google. <laughs> exactly. Just Google the title. All the links will come up. Yeah. Yeah. It's not hard to find, especially these days. Not hard to find at all. But thank you for supporting my book, though. I really appreciate it. No, we and 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 I meant every word. This is a book that can transform the way we do education at all the levels, at the teacher education program level, school district level, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and at a national level. But people have to be willing to take on that challenge and understand that this is something that's needed in all of our schools. And it's not only going to just impact our black and brown children is going to impact all children. Yeah. It's impact everybody. Yeah. Try it. Release the fear. And, and, and what can come from it can be a beautiful thing. If only we release that stuff. All right. Oh, um, looks like Caroline found the website. It's bookshop.org. Oh, bookshop. Yep. My friend Stephanie just told me about it last week. Yep. Dot org. Thank you, Caroline. So bookshop.org, make sure you all buy Cultivating Genius. Add that to your library. Add that to your book list, please. Mm -hmm. Do yourself that favor. But Dr. Goldie Muhammad, thank you again. It has been thank an you, honor Catherine. to have you on this podcast. And, you know, we're going to continue to build. Yes, together. Together yeah. we will build. <laughs> yes, and please keep on putting in the good work and let's continue to support uh, Dr. Muhammad as she does this work. This is yes, something that thank you. Work. Yes, let's continue to do that. So I hope you have a good night and let you get some rest. I know we are way over time, but you know what? I don't even care because- I don't either. And you just woke me back up. See, I was like, oh, okay, I'll do the interview and go to sleep. And now I'm all <laughs> amped about social change, no. education. No. Well, yeah. Talk more, but yeah. 
don't, I don't care. This is one of those episodes where you know what? If we had gone two hours, I'd be good with two hours because guess what? People need to hear this. Yeah, yeah. Like people need to hear this. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. All right. And thank you all for tuning in to I Dang Talk for Educators Live. Uh, before we wrap things up, I just want to make a few announcements. Because as you know, edu Identity Talk for Educators Live is just one component of the Identity Talk umbrella. And we have so many things going on within um, our company. Uh, first thing is we officially launched our virtual school, which houses two courses. First course is Shape to Teach Identity 101, which is all focused on shaping our identities as teachers, developing knowledge of self in order to get an idea of who we are in and out of the classroom. So we're talking about culturally responsive practices. We're also talking about anti-racist practices, techniques and tools for teaching, such as classroom management, family and parent engagement, lesson planning, and all mm -hmm. the other aspects of the teaching craft. So if you are a new teacher who's looking to get some professional development credits, because if you're a teacher in the state of Massachusetts, this is DESI approved. So you can get some professional development credits towards your license if you're looking for some. Uh, make sure you check us out and book a call at calendly.com slash identity talk for educators. And then also for those educators who are interested in learning how to self-publish a book, make sure you check out the Self-Publishing Educators Learning Lab. And this is a book for educators who want to become authors, who want to learn about the whole process from start to finish. So even if you're a person who does not have any writing experience or publishing experience, please make sure you check out the SPELL program and you can book an appointment to learn more about it at kindly.com slash talk for educators. And then finally, during this fall season, you have to have some teacher swag. So if you need some hoodies, t-shirts, we have a whole bunch of new designs in our Identity Talk Apparel shop, which you can find on Facebook. If you type Identity Talk Apparel, we just released that a few days ago. And we also have the website on the Teesprings um, website. And you can see the URL there, teespring.com slash store slash identity talk apparel shop. So make sure you check us out there. And that's pretty much it, people. We are about to conclude another episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live. And I'm your host, Kwame Salfa Mensa. And on behalf of Dr. Goldie Muhammad, we wish you a good night, a good morning, a good afternoon, whenever you are in the world. <laughs> and we're going to do this again another time. Yeah. All right, peace out, people. Bye.